Hi, everybody. I'm Judy, the YouTube lawyer. Today, we have our special guest, Florida criminal defense attorney, Louis Rivera's attorney, Chuck Collins. So he is here live. He's taking time out of his busy schedule to be with us on Sunday afternoon. As I said in the chat box, I came down with COVID. So today I do have an excuse for my congested, terrible voice. So um, please bear with me and let's introduce our guest to the stream. Hi, Chuck. Can I call you Chuck? Yes, ma'am. Uh, good afternoon. Esquire. <laughs> no, just call me Chuck. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for joining in today's live stream show. I know we have tons of very dedicated followers of the Dan Markell murder case who are just so riveted and, you know, we're eating up any information we can find out about the case. So people are excited to hear from you and thank you for being here. So um, can you tell us a little bit about your background first and how you wound up going to law school? Sure, uh, Judy. Uh, I, uh, I, came, I came from a family of uh, people who follow the case may know. I practiced with my father, David Collins. Uh, my father was an attorney. Uh, I grew up actually in South Florida in Miami-Dade County. My father was an assistant state attorney for uh, then state attorney Janet Reno, who ended up obviously becoming the U.S. attorney general during the Clinton administration. So it was just something that uh, I kind of fell into. Uh, I'm sure my dad would have rather me have gone to medical school, just never really excelled in math and science. So uh, ended up going to law school, uh, went to undergrad at the University of Florida, uh, after I graduated from there, I attended law school at Florida A&M, actually in Orlando, was a prosecutor down there for a couple of years and then decided to come back home up here and uh, go into practice with my father. I've been practicing. It's a general practice because I practice out of a small rural county called Jefferson County to the east of Tallahassee. It's, it's mainly a general practice, but we do concentrate pretty heavily in criminal trial practice and appeals. So that's kind of a broad overview of my practice. Mm -hmm. And so did you grow up in the same area where you practice now? Uh, for a short bit. I moved up to North Florida in 1998 uh, when I was still in high school. So I attended high school up here in the North Florida era, area locally. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. I see. Yes. So um, can you tell us a little bit about how you became Louis Rivera's attorney? Yes, ma'am. Uh, not much to it, really. Uh, every circuit in Florida, every judicial circuit has what's called a registry, uh, which is a list of attorneys who, when a indigent defendant who is being prosecuted uh, needs representation and the public defender's office can't afford them representation because of a conflict of interest, uh, there is a registry. Uh, there's a very specific registry for attorneys who are what are called uh, capital qualified in the state of Florida. That means when the state is seeking the death penalty as a potential punishment in a case. So it, it it's on a rotation randomly uh, if you're on the list. So it was just pure random that I had been assigned to Mr. Rivera's case. And uh, that's how I became involved. Mm -hmm. Yes. And um, so was it sometime in July of 2016 that you got appointed? Uh, that sounds right, uh, Judy. As I, I think I alluded to prior to coming on, I do not have uh, the file in front of me, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I'm here, yeah. uh, not at the office, obviously. So yeah. I'm sure you know the date better than I do. Oh, OK. Yeah, because there's actually a channel run by another attorney. He calls himself Mentor Lawyer. Um, his real name, I think, is James Wojcicki, but he has a pretty big YouTube channel called Deep Dive True Crime, where he's covered this whole case extensively from the very beginning, I think, um, back mm -hmm. when there weren't that many people that knew much about the case. Um, yeah, so he actually flashed up on the screen in a video, you know, the order from the ju Judge Hankinson appointing you to be the attorney and oh. some other things about the case. Yeah. So um, so when you find out that you're appointed to represent someone, what do you do next in general? Well, you find out as much information about the case as you can uh, and you, you go meet your client. Uh, you, you, you go from there. Mm -hmm. Well, where was he? Wasn't he in a federal prison somewhere else? 
No, ma'am. By the time I first met Mr. Rivera, he was already at the Leon County Jail. To the oh. best of my recollection. Yes. I see. Yeah. And um, can you describe to us, like, what's the jail like? I think a lot of people are interested in, you know, what is jail like, especially now that Charlie Adelson is living there? <laughs> well, uh, jail's jail. There's, I, I, I don't know really how to describe it. Uh, it's, it's, it's a big building. It's got bars, very little windows, very little contact with the outside world. Uh, it's not a pleasant place. Uh, how it's portrayed on TV, is that necessarily uh, 100% accurate? No, I, I don't know. Uh, it's not It's not a good place to be. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, so what's the setup like when attorneys need to meet with their clients in that jail? Well, I mean, it, it, it varies. It varies with what type of defendant you're, you're, you're meeting. Uh, obviously, there can be defendants with mental health issues or, or regular health issues or, or someone like Mr. Rivera, uh, who at that point in time uh, did have a co-defendant or was about to have a co-defendant or had a co-defendant while he was being housed there in a very high profile case. So, uh, the conditions, if you're asking what Mr. Rivera was facing while he was in the Leon County Jail, uh, I would I, I would safely state that they were much more stringent, uh, maybe not as as much liberty, uh, not as many liberties he had as an inmate at the Leon County Jail as compared to other normal inmates. If that makes sense uh, in terms of uh, access, maybe to television, telephones, things of that nature. Mm hmm. I see. And are you able to tell us, you know, what what were your impressions of Mr. Rivera when you first met him? Or do you even remember? I know you have. Yeah, hundreds I, I, I of do remember. Of uh, yeah. You know, uh, he was a little tiny guy for for what you read prior to going and visiting him and, and knowing, uh, you know, how, how, how horrendous the whole the whole thing was in uh, reading about the affiliations with other, you know, criminal groups, uh, gangs. Uh, I think in your mind, you, you, you picture some, you know, big thug, hardened criminal. And uh, my impression was he was a little tiny guy. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it went from there. Uh, we, when you're dealing with someone like Mr. Rivera facing what he was, uh, they're, 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 they're observing you just as much as you're, you're observing them. If that makes sense. Uh, yeah. you, 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 they're really watching you just as much as you're watching them. And they're trying to make, you know, uh, estimations, uh, gauging your character, your credibility, if they can trust you and believe you. So, uh, we took it pretty slow with Lewis and, uh, I believe, well, I know uh, he, I gained his trust and uh, he, we were able to have a good attorney-client relationship. Mm -hmm. Well, um, how many times did you meet with him roughly before he decided uh, he was going to do the proffer? And... I, I honestly don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I, I spent a lot of time with Lewis. <laughs> mm -hmm. I spent times with him at the Leon County Jail. He had been transferred over to the Jefferson County Jail in the county of which my office was in for quite some time. I, I don't know how many times. I'm sure. Uh, I, I believe I've seen or heard that uh, certain trips that we may have made <laughs> in, a, a, uh, in a in a in a van to various parts of the state. I, I think those are all public record now, and people have observed yeah. those. I. I don't know how much time I spent with Lewis, but if you're asking how much time I spent with him before he gave the proffer, I don't think it was very long. Mm -hmm. It wasn't yeah. a great, it wasn't a great deal of time. And the reason why I say that is I, I know at one point in time, I believe we had filed a demand for speedy trial. So it, my whole representation of him did not last incredibly long. Yeah, that's what I was kind of surprised about when I saw the information on Deep Dive True Crime recently. Yeah. Um, it looks like the drive along, at, at least the video I saw when you guys were driving past Trescott Drive, that was September 30th, I think, 2016. Sure. And I saw an, a news article where you had asked for a change of venue 
And that was also in September, wasn't that? Yeah. September 2016 also. So yes, so it's like your trial was scheduled for October at first, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. That, that, so that sounds accurate. Yeah. Yeah. Everything just happened so quickly. It was like in a blink of an eye almost, you know, so your representation of him ultimately was just what, like three months, two months? Uh, yeah, yes, ma'am. That, that sounds about wow. right. Wow. Okay. Well, um, can you tell us like... Just in general, like how does a proffer work? Because everybody's so excited when we heard about Katie McBanua making a proffer. Well, I mean, proffers can be done in a lot of various ways. Uh, I have no idea, and I, I'm not, uh, excuse me, there's a bug, uh, going to opine as to how Miss Magbanua's uh, most recent proffer or whatever's happening recently in regard to her meeting with the state attorney's office, how that's being conducted mm -hmm. or how it was conducted. I have no idea. Uh, generally when you're in backing up from the word proffer, just to the, the concept of cooperation generally, uh, when you have co-defendants such as this case, uh, you, you generally know that most times, not all times, because the government can have a very strong case against all defendants, but usually there is going to be a, a, a weaker case against one of the defendants, maybe, so to speak. Uh, that person is generally going to be in a position where they can potentially help themselves. Uh, when, when you have that situation, you usually want to reach out to the government early to say, you know, we may be interested in, in, in speaking with you. Uh, we do believe that we have information, but of course, we don't want to just give it for nothing. We would like to know what we could get in exchange. Uh, if the government seems interested after that, there's usually a series of things that happen. But that, that's how you, you look at a case, engage it for cooperation, in my experience at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Well, is there any sort of official form like where you have to do something in writing, listing no. out all the details no. of what your client's willing to say? Oh. No, not in my experience. Uh, I, 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 there's nothing that has to be reduced to writing. Uh, any time in which my client is going to elect to participate and cooperate and potentially give information to the government, it's always reduced in writing. Uh, some type of immunity agreement, at least describing whether they have use immunity, derivative immunity, things of that nature. But just so that's reduced to writing. Excuse me, I have a dog. Oh, okay. Oh. Yes. Okay. But um, when your client is planning to make a proffer, you and your client don't actually have any idea of what deal the government might be willing to offer, right? They don't tell the person until after all the details are given? Uh, it, it varies. Uh, usually, it goes down. Th this is an example. Because there, there's no, uh, Judy, I don't want anyone to think that there's a set, this is how it happens every time. Uh, so many state attorney's offices are different in how they approach things. Uh, generally, after you indicate that you may be willing to cooperate and the government indicates that there is interest in cooperating, you have an informal sit down. Uh, just kind of not maybe give uh, give the government all the uh, the whole pie, so to speak, but give them some uh, things that they didn't maybe already know. And then, of course, they in that that's a usually a quick informal session where you give a little bit of information maybe and then they go and verify it and then if they find it to be credible usually they come back and say we would like to follow up on such and such areas of what we discussed and then if that turns out to be more fruitful and credible then usually there's uh, another meeting somewhere in the line in which the, you have given them credible information it's been vetted and they've confirmed it then usually there starts to be a discussion of before we go any further, we need to know ballpark wise what you're willing to give, uh, because if we're not going to, you know, know what we're, you're going to give us in exchange uh, and, you know, we're giving you credible information at this point in time, we do not see the need to help you any further. And somewhere in the course of that is usually when you get a range. Uh, Rivera's case was a little different from what I remember and you may know more than me at this point because it was apparent 
that the government was interested in cooperating, but we didn't know if if anyone else was cooperating at that point in time. So what we tried to do, one of the things we did is we, we filed a demand for speedy trial to try to shorten the amount of time in which other potential people could cooperate. And it really gave us the benefit of uh, being able to uh, get a good cooperation deal uh, quite quickly because the government knew that we were going to be going to trial and it acted as a severance. So we would be the sole party going to trial at that point in time. The other parties would get a complete preview of the state's case. Uh, and it, it, it made the government really have, I think, a good incentive to give Mr. Rivera the best deal possible, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yes, I see. Yeah, thanks for that information. And at what point does it start getting videotaped? Because something was definitely videotaped that we can see also. On yes, the yes. And that, that videotape, I have seen it on the news here and there. Uh, I believe that was at the Jefferson County Jail, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I don't know. I don't even know if that was intentionally videotaped or if that was just surveillance video from the jail. I, I, I really don't know, nor do I remember. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there was no formal point where it's like, okay, let's get Lewis in this room and let's turn on the camera and no. start recording. No, ma'am. I see. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, in terms of that whole ride along where you and Lewis had to be in a van driving all around Tallahassee, <laughs> can you tell us how that day went? That was the longest day ever. Uh, it wasn't just Tallahassee. Oh. Uh, if I remember, that you van went. You were looking for the gun, right? Yeah, that van went, uh, when it was to Naples. I mean, we went all the way down 75 before we got to the alley, which is the uh, the tip of Florida. <laughs> for those of y'all don't live oh. down here. Uh, they, the government believed, and uh, I'm not, trying to to make uh statements about their belief but they believe that they could put uh lewis rivera in a van years after this had happened yeah uh knowing that he's completely illiterate not completely illiterate but can't read write real good doesn't have a real good uh sense of direction geography things of that nature but none, nonetheless they believe they could put him in the van those years later and he would be able to pinpoint where the firearm, if I'm not mistaken, was yeah. thrown out. Yeah. Uh, uh, what had happened, I believe, initially, and I'm sure you know all this, is we had suggested that maybe they look at the first body of water, navigable river, east of Tallahassee on I-10. And they did. They looked in the Alcilla River, if I'm not mistaken, on the Jefferson-Madison County line, just one, two counties over from Tallahassee, and they found a firearm and it was the type of firearm that had been sitting there for so long. Uh, it obviously wasn't the uh, murder weapon, but it was in such a deteriorated state, if I'm not mistaken, that they could not rule it out right away. Hmm. So it also initially gave Mr. Rivera a lot of credibility with that as well. Uh, but that wasn't it. And we stopped at probably every body of water on I-10 or I-75 all the way to Naples. Uh, trying to see if Mr. Rivera could confirm that's where the weapon may have been. <laughs> was that over the span of one day or multiple days? That was over the span of about 18 hours. Uh, there may have been, there may have been, I think what you're confusing, if I recall, there, there were probably two trips in a van with me and Lewis. Mm -hmm. I believe there was one trip where we went through Tallahassee. Yes, that's the one I saw. Okay. Deep dive true crime well there was another one. <laughs> oh, yeah oh but then in the interim i mean i part of my stupidity but i'm assuming you know lewis had to be guarded at all times and so he had to be like brought back to the jail and then pick him up from the jail again for the second trip and um but I mean, from a logistics standpoint, while they're running, you know, running outside the van trying to look for a gun, what were you and Lewis doing? Just trapped in the van together? Well, uh, we, we had a lot of 
law enforcement officers, obviously, uh, with us. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, we spent a lot of time in the van together. Uh huh. <laughs> okay. Well, what if he needed to eat something? Then what did they do? Just bring him fast food in the van? Pretty much. Uh huh. I see. Were, were his ankles shackled also? I'm assuming his hands were shackled. Yes. I mean, he, he, he was completely restrained. We were in the company of many, many heavily armed law enforcement officers. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that just sounds like a very stressful situation. And I mean, wow. It was an unusual situation. Yeah. What a day. I mean, how often do you have to be in that kind of situation for your clients where you're stuck in a van with them for making hours? Mem on? Making, uh, making memories. I, I have never been in that situation before. <laughs> Well, were you were you making small talk with Lewis during that time or or getting to know him personally or, or just kind of sitting there in silence because you knew everything was being recorded? I mean, Judy, you you make small talk, uh, you know, after about eight, nine hours, though, you're really done with small talk and just want this uh, this nightmare of a road trip to be over with. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I see, because I, I guess you couldn't listen to music or just zone out or anything not no, really. uh, it, it, it wasn't a luxury vehicle <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh yeah I'll, I'll just leave it at that <laughs> yeah and when you're a court appointed attorney for these types of cases don't you guys get paid a flat fee or is there a way to get paid by the hour some of these lawyers uh i guess they know ways to to put together these incredible bills uh, I guess there are ways to exceed the statutory cap in the trying to think of how long I've handled these types of cases at this point. I think it's 11, 12 years, maybe I've never exceeded the statutory cap once. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, I just, I never have. Yeah. But I, what I'm wondering is, um, do the attorneys just get paid a flat fee regardless of how many hours a case takes them? There's a flat fee. And then I believe there is a basis uh, somewhere in the statute that if you believe that you work so many hours uh, in excess of what is just under the, the flat fee that you can petition the court for what's called extraordinary fees. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. Yeah, so the answer is no. You normally don't get paid. I, I did. I see the exact question, uh, and the question of that uh, lady is no, ma'am. I did not get paid by the hour. I got paid a flat fee. The flat fee mm -hmm. by statute, uh, I can tell you right now, was twenty five thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Yeah, the government paid me to represent Mr. Rivera. Yes, and and people are guessing that, say, for Katie McBanuit's defense, that it could have been you know, well over seven, several hundred thousands of dollars, you know, for the three attorneys and everything. So, I mean, do you also take clients that are privately retained? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I do. I do. Yeah. And the only, the only court appointed work I do is the, uh, the capital work. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't, I don't do exclusively court appointed work. Uh, I have a very general practice, like I said, with my father out in Jefferson County. So we're not a big metropolitan area. It's a pretty rural area. We call it an open door practice sometimes because our doors always open to the locals. Uh, I do, like I said, mainly criminal work. I do a lot of general civil litigation, family law here and there, just, just basically whatever the community has a need for. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's see. So, let me try to ask you some other questions before we get to the questions that are here in the chat box here. Sure. Um, so the change you made a motion for change of venue, which was denied. Um, do you think at this point that say Charlie Adelson's attorney might make a motion for change of venue and get it granted? Or is that very, very rare in Florida? <clears throat> well, that's, to answer the question, do, would I expect his attorney to file a motion for change of venue? Yes, uh, yeah. I, I think I think that that would be expected. Would it be granted? I don't know. Uh, you know, this case, it's so wild in that it's gotten so much 
media attention even all these years after it. And I understand. I understand what a terrible tragedy it was. I, I truly do and how just crazy it was. But do every common day people who would be on a venire panel have that much intimate knowledge of it? I don't know. And that, that that's really what it comes down to. How much do they really know about it? And is it of such a nature that they would not be able to be fair and impartial? And uh, in my experience, those are generally denied pre-trial unless just something extraordinary that you can show the court. And it's something that if you believe uh, after you've got in there in jury selection and started to uh, select a jury and you are running into issues where there has been so much media attention and it, it, it has become now more apparent that you can't receive fair and impartial jurors, then, then that would be something you would renew at that point in time and then then potentially have it granted. But, you know, it. I, I believe a motion for change of venue has been filed, I think, prior to every one of these trials at this point in time now, probably. And yeah, probably. I don't, think, I don't know exactly. I don't think it, it I, know, I mean, it hasn't been granted either time. So I, I don't know why the next time it would, if that makes sense. Yeah, I see. Okay, well, let's take a look here. Fancy Fiction has covered the case very extensively on her channel also with a lot of the wiretapped phone calls turned into videos. So um, her question is, it was reported that Lewis was beat up pretty bad behind bars. Could you speak more about that? I, I didn't know about that, but. I don't have any direct knowledge of that. I would add that I have not seen Mr. Rivera since my representation ended of him. I take that back. I may have seen him once since when he had been brought over here. Uh, I have, I have had correspondence with him without getting into the nature of a correspondence. All I know is that uh, he is under a lot of pressure, obviously. Uh, I, I do believe he is genuinely in fear for his life. Uh, I don't have any knowledge of any specific incidents, though. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Brittany said, did Lewis seem remorseful? Yes, he did. And I know that probably seems... Uh, not believable uh if i wasn't saying it i probably wouldn't find it believable either if that makes sense but uh knowing you know what his background was his affiliation with a gang but uh yes uh in my experience mr rivera was uh incredibly remorseful mm -hmm. okay and um ariana grande's ponytail just wants to say that she found lewis very credible um, Fancy also wants to know, what do you make of McBanua's defense attorney Tara Kawas's comments on camera, strongly implying the most plausible, plausible reason Sigfredo Garcia did not testify was because he would be considered a snitch by fellow inmates. She implied this would be, death, be a death sentence, yet you got Lewis to come forward, and he seems fine. Hmm. It's a, it's a good point. Uh, I, I don't like the Monday morning quarterback, other lawyers, especially ones that I don't really know. I, I don't know what her basis was for saying that. I, I expect that she had a good basis for doing such. Uh, that's all I can tell you. Yeah, I think I recall Georgia Kappelman saying in one of the YouTube interviews that maybe he couldn't keep his story straight. But you know, <laughs> yeah. who knows why he ended yeah. up not be another plausible reason, yes. Yeah. Um, let's see. Okay, let's see what other questions are out there. Oh, okay. Brittany mentions fancy fiction. If you look at Lewis's court records, he keeps writing to Georgia asking to not have to serve his Florida sentence because that's where he'll be in danger, but he's safe where he's currently at. Well, um is is that something that's common for for inmates to be attacked in jail or in prison? Well, I, I believe Mr. Rivera is in federal custody right custody yes. right now, mm -hmm. and uh, I that that's under the United States Bureau of Prisons, uh, what we refer to as the BOP. Uh, the BOP uh, does have much more secure facilities, in my experience, than the uh, Florida Department of Corrections, a, a DOC facility. Mm -hmm. I see. 
Okay. And um, just to make clear, once the person makes the proffer and they get their deal, then that's it, right? They can't continue to keep trying to bargain or get a better deal for future testimony. Yeah, that that that's my general understanding. I would say with the caveat that uh, this case is so strange. It, it continues to be so strange. Nothing would ever surprise me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let me go through some of these comments. Thank you guys for being out there watching. Um, did you watch the cross-examination of Lewis and pretrial and how do you think it played for a jury? I think, didn't you tell me that you haven't had time to really watch the trial? Uh, I I mean, I've, I've listened to it uh, when it's live streamed, when I'm driving, believe it or not, between court proceedings when I have time. But as far as actually being able to sit down and watch uh, testimony, I, I haven't been able to. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I would really want to, if even if I had the time. Yeah, that's right, because that's work, you know, and <laughs> you're not getting paid right. any extra to listen to more of this trial testimony. Yeah, exactly. Well, well what about, well, um, so for example, one of the, one of Meg Banua's defense attorneys was questioning Lewis and trying to imply that um, the Latin Kings had something to do with it. But um, I'm pretty sure, I mean, would you say that the Latin Kings really had nothing to do with this case? That's what Lewis was basically saying back to the guy. Uh, other than that, certain folks who were involved in the trial may have been members or associated with them. I, I completely agree with you. Uh, I don't know of any record evidence to show that they were involved in it. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Okay. Um, this one, I'm not sure if you can answer. Did Lewis reveal more about the Adelsons? I mean, what what's out there is out there, right? There's well, no extra. I, I mean, right. What what you've heard, uh, I, I assume what he's testified to in court is the same as what he initially had explained to me, and uh, that that's all I know. Mm -hmm. I see. And um, this is the question a lot of people have been wondering: Did Lewis really see Wendy at Dan's um, block or in near his home? Um, I thought the belief was that it happened the day before Dan was shot, that um, Lewis said that he had seen Wendy walking down the street and Siegfried who said something like, there's my homie or that's the lady, you know. Who wasn't I, I, I recall that statement, uh, Judy, like I said, I don't remember if it was uh, the day of, a day before or a different day, like like, like you have just referenced. Uh, I, I do recall him making that statement. Mm -hmm. I don't remember what exactly date it was okay. in terms of the date he was referring to when he saw her. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think maybe it was even um, something where he couldn't even remember exactly what day it was also, but um, there were actually two trips, right? Two trips that Sigfredo and Lewis had made to attempt to kill Dan. That was my understanding. There were, yeah, yes, yeah. multiple trips. Yeah. And Nellie is saying maybe he was wrong about where they threw the gun. Yeah, it seemed like Lewis definitely had no idea. You know, he said, didn't he try to draw something or he said something? It was near a bridge. But how many bridges are there? So like tons of bridges. And and a it was actually Sigfredo. Wasn't it Sigfredo who took apart the gun and threw it out? So I, Lewis. I don't remember. Oh, OK. OK, that's just what I remember because I've been reading all this. And your memory is probably correct. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I, I know I'm bringing back stuff that happened almost seven years ago, you know, six and a half years ago in this case where you represented him for two to three months max. And I'm grilling you about it. But, that's all right. but, but you see how how interested people are in this case. There are a lot of people who have it's been it's following incredible. Yeah. every detail, you know. Yeah. So um, let's see. Okay, Catherine Armstrong says Mr. Rivera got a good deal. Dawn, who also has her own channel, um, says thank you for doing this for our community, Chuck. No. Um, Nellie says, is there any time limit for our lawyers for how long they represent their clients? No, right? <laughs> I mean, there's no time limit. As long uh, as Judy, I, I got a little dog in the house. Excuse me sure. one second. I'm sorry. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Get in. 
So, okay, guys, thank you so much. And um, yeah, since today's a day, you can hear kid yelling back there. I think he probably has to get going within the next 10 or so minutes, but I'll try to get through some of these questions quickly. Oh, for a, for a flat fee. Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, and that's why a lot of attorneys, they don't want to do regular court-appointed work or they don't even want to do court-appointed work in general after a while. If you can get more privately retained clients, you can get paid a ton more um, doing privately retained clients. So, which is kind of sad because, you know, then the poor I apologize. Start to suffer. Oh, no problem. Okay, so, um, yeah, Nelly was... Um, telling us that her question really had to do with for the flat fee. Is there a time limit for how uh, long you represent? A, a, a time limit, if you're asking how long my representation of Mr. Rivera lasted, uh, my represent my appointment by the court was for uh, to dispose of his, his case that was pending in a trial status, so to speak. So once, once his case was disposed of by him entering a plea and being sentenced, uh, to the 19 year sentence, uh, my representation of them pursuant to the court appointment uh, ended. Mm -hmm. I see. If that, if that answers that question. Um, yes, but let's say like somebody's case drags out for like a whole year. Okay. Is there just like a way where you can petition and ask for a little bit more? Well, that that's where it goes back to, like I said, there's the flat fee, but you could always petition the court for extraordinary fees. Uh, and the, what they'll do is you have to keep track of every minute you spend on the case. And then you have a hearing and they determine what they're going to give you as a billable hour and apply that to the time. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the reasons why I like to do criminal law is that I don't have to do all that timekeeping, so to speak. So, mm -hmm. uh, I, like I said, I, I don't know if I have ever uh, exceeded. I, well, I know I never have exceeded a flat fee in a case on one of these cases. I see. Okay, to what extent did Lewis's or anyone's level of remorse factor it into the deal they get from the state? Well, Does that count for anything? Remorse? Uh, I, I would say in most cases, it absolutely does. Uh, did Was his remorse a factor in the deal he got in this case? I, I, don't, I don't think that that really had anything to do with it. I think w what he had going for him in the deal that he got was the the time situation uh by filing that demand for speedy trial and being out in front of everyone in the state needing knowing that they needed more evidence from someone to get other people and with that shortened period of time and the the credible evidence that he did give them uh that's what got him the deal he got mm -hmm. yeah definitely and looks to me and a lot of other people that he did the smart thing. So, oh, this is a good question. Carol Lieber wants to know, is it surprising that Rivera turned on his oldest friend? They must have been involved in other crimes. I, I don't have any knowledge of it, of that. Uh, mm -hmm. Is it surprising? I, I don't know. Uh, you know, th there's an old saying uh, that, co-defendants are like crabs in a bucket constantly pulling each other down uh there's no loyalty amongst people in my experience when they're faced in these types of situations friends will turn on friends i think maybe sooner in this case you might learn if family members will turn on family members it seems mm -hmm. yeah you just never know i mean after no. a while it's like who cares that i've known you since i was five or whatever so no. yeah um, how often do you get to meet and talk to the defendant when representing him? I guess this is a general question. Uh, it varies. You know, it varies on the type of case. It, it varies what we're doing on the case. Uh, it, it varies on the defendant. Uh, in, in Mr. Rivera's case, uh, I, I met with him a lot. I met with him a lot because there was a lot going on in a short period of time. Mm -hmm. Yes. And is it a long drive for you to get from your office to, say, Leon County Jail? Uh, it, it's it's a good 45 minutes, but uh, and I'm so, sorry you have COVID, Judy. I hope you feel better. One of the yeah. great things from the pandemic is some of the technology that's come from it. Uh, 
we now have the ability to video conference with all of our clients at the Leon County Jail from our office in Jefferson County. So it, it's it's really made it where you can have more contact with your clients. Uh, you just call yeah. ahead and say, can you put so-and-so on the video conferencing in 30 minutes? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. Good yeah. to hear. Um, did Lewis's comment that he didn't want to mess with kids or, or he didn't want to, I think he said something about how he felt bad because he didn't want to kill somebody over some effing kids. I uh, think that might have been one of the things that made him spill the beans, so to speak. Uh, he, Mr. Rivera had kids. Uh, you know, I think maybe one of the reasons why, and this is speculation, not anything he told me, uh, one of the reasons why he did his involvement in this case was probably for a certain extent, because he thought it was a way he could provide for his family. I know that sounds terrible by killing someone else's uh, father. I, I don't condone it nor uh, approve of it, but I think that was one of the reasons why he was involved in this. And uh, I think that weighed on him a lot. Mm -hmm. Yes. And similarly, I don't know if you can answer this, but how did Lewis exhibit remorse? I mean, he he was almost crying on the stand, actually. Shed some was tears. He? I, I didn't know. Uh, he just seemed very genuine. It wasn't a... Uh, it wasn't a situation in which you really had to uh, pull information from him, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So he wanted to share the information. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good. Um, okay. So this is a good question. Hi, Angela. Um, curious, did you go through extra training to become a specialized lawyer handling proffers? Seems challenging, like playing chess with the prosecution to get your client the best deal. No specialized training. Uh, I was fortunate enough to, uh, you know, work at the state attorney's office, see things from that perspective, prosecuting cases with some some very experienced uh, prosecutors. Uh, and then uh, being able to work with my father, who has almost 40 years experience doing this on the state and defense side as well. So I, I got to observe a lot prior to doing this. And I, I will say this. This case, the way things happened and I'm not saying this to mean that they were done incorrectly or anything of that nature. I'm just saying it, it, it was so unique in terms of the timing, uh, the media attention it got, the people involved. It was, it was just a very unique case. I, I can't hear you. I still can't hear you. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, it looks like my battery is dying on. I can't hear you again, Judy. <laughs> okay. Sorry about this. My battery is dying on this laptop, and it looks like I forgot to bring the plug into this room, so we might have to wrap things up real That's fast. That's fine. Yeah, but thank you so much for taking time out today. People are really um, so grateful for you to be able to show up here and talk to us briefly about this case. And um, it, it is a very riveting case. And Charlie Adelson's trial is supposed to start at the very end of April. Um, so we'll see what happens with that case. Um, any parting words about your involvement in the case or practicing criminal defense in general? Uh, make sure your kids get really good math and science grades and they become medical doctors. I think that would be a, a good advice. <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, my okay. father is a doctor, as are a lot of my relatives. So, you know, I kind of <laughs> tell that to, to the younger generation, too, that um, being a doctor is often um, probably a lot more lucrative than being an attorney these days. <laughs> yeah. You, you take care and have a wonderful evening, okay. Judy. I hope Thank you, you so better. much for your time. Good luck with all your cases. Yes, okay. ma'am. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Sorry about the technical difficulties here. So I... Uh, let me call it COVID brain fog. I will be like Tara Kawas and use that as an excuse for my bad memory. But um, I'm sitting here, just got that little notification saying that your battery is running extremely low and I don't have the charger here. It's in another part of this area. So 
Um, okay, well, there we there we have it. Um, great to hear from attorney Chuck Collins from Florida talk about his role in the case and um, his dealings with his former client, Luis Rivera. So I hope you guys have a great COVID-free rest of the day.